Come home to Jesus. This is the message that Max Solbrechen has proclaimed for 50 years to multitudes across the world. His crusades have taken him to the Hindus of India, Muslims of Pakistan, Buddhists of Sri Lanka, voodoo worshippers of Haiti, Catholics of Malta, and headhunters of northern Luzon. He has preached God's Word in stadiums, churches, tents, universities, and prisons. He comes to you today with the message of God's love and power. The man who is not afraid to preach the truth, Pastor Max Solbrechen. I'd like to read, open the script, the service with the Word of God here. And I'd like to read from St. John chapter 1. Remain standing, please. I'd like to read from verse number 26. It's about John the Baptist. Well, let's go back to verse number 23. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as, this, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then? If thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither the prophet, or that prophet. John answered them, saying, I baptize the water, but there stand the one among you whom you know not. He it is, who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Beth Abera, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God was taken away the sin of the world. This is he, of whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove. It abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with the water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. And I knew him not, but he that sent me, the Heavenly Father, to baptize with the water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he was baptized with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Shall we bow for prayer? Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that washes away our sins. Thank you for the word of God that keeps us straight. Lord, the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit that is our comforter, the one who comforts us in times of need and sorrow and, and trials. And he, Jesus, that baptizes us with the Holy Spirit and fire. Lord, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. Come now. And fill with the blessed Holy Spirit today. Come and charge our hearts with thy love and thy mercy and thy grace. And thy goodness and thy peace and thy power. We pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for God's glory. And everyone would you please shout a great big amen. amen. Slip up your hands and shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. I'd like to read from the, from the word of God. I was working on this sermon, on this message. I've been working on it for the past week. Why revival tarries? And I, at about midnight, I put the finishing touches on it. I've been working on it for, for several weeks. It's been in my spirit, in my spirit. And when I was over there in Honolulu, I preached a message also. When we stopped in Vancouver, I preached for the full gospel businessmen. In Langley, we had a tremendous move of God. And in the Pentecostal church in Vancouver, two nights. And now, of course, they want me to come for crusades there. So, And, and a Mission Alliance church wants me to come. A large Alliance church wants revival. 
and, uh, and another place where there are a number of churches in the lower man, mainland want me to come. I mean, there's such a hunger for, the, for God and some of these churches. And uh, so I've been, and I, I shared a message entitled, um, Why Jesus Has Not Yet Come. And that's another sermon. And I always preached for many years that there were two reasons why Jesus has not yet come. And the first reason is found in 2 Peter chapter 3, where it says that God doesn't reckon time like we do. A thousand years with him is like a like one a thousand years with us is like one day with him. He hasn't been gone very long, less than two days. And the second is that he is not willing that any should perish. He's waiting for more and more people to be saved. And if he had come a hundred years ago, we wouldn't have been in included. He waited for us, didn't he? But I think there's a third reason. And I shared this at the full gospel businessmen. And I mean, it was powerful. There's a third reason. And it's in Psalms 3. Ask of me. And I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. God the Father said, Son, what do you want? What do you want? I want the heathen for my inheritance. Why haven't the heathen been saved? The church is sleeping. That's why people are being saved. He said, I will give you the heathen for your inheritance in the uttermost parts of the earth for my possession. In the beginning, the church was on fire. They filled Jerusalem with the doctrine of Christ. They turned the world upside down. Within a hundred years, there were churches everywhere across, across that part of the world. But what is happening today a billion Muslims who don't believe in Jesus. They hate the cross. They don't believe he died on the cross. They believe he's going to come back and kill all the Christians if they don't accept the Muslim faith. There are millions and hundreds of millions of pagans who are not saved. I was talking to Someone from the, a friend of mine from the Beulah Alliance. And they have now got a goal. They want to win 1% of the city of Edmonton to Jesus. They want, they want to reach 1%. I could preach on that now, but I'm going to speak on why, why revival tarries. I'm turning to the book of, of Acts. The third chapter, I wish to read from the 19th verse, reading as follows in Jesus' name. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive, until the times of restitution, times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Let's pray, please. Father, anoint thy servant that I may speak as the oracles of God. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will let this message come out like fire. Oh my God, Lord, like a hammer and like fire with, less, with much grace and love. Because we do fear you, oh Lord. We do love you. We pray a blessing upon this people and all of our loved ones. And this area in Alberta and our nation of Canada. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you shout a great big hallelujah? hallelujah. You may be seated, please. There are a number of reasons why 
the mighty works of God are not manifested in this generation. Even though Almighty God has promised in his word to work in and through us for that purpose. St. Peter says, repent ye therefore and be converted. I had an old friend in Winnipeg and he was a Scotsman. He said, are ye converted? Are ye converted? He said, you say you're saved, but are ye converted? You say you're saved, but are you converted? Has there been a change in your life? He says here, repent you therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing, that speaks of revival. There have been a lot of refresh, refreshments. Great revivals have come in the last 2,000 years. There have been great revivals. Revival after revival, the American revival, the Welsh revival. Revivals. And the revivals will continue until the last soul has been brought in. And then Jesus will come. It says here, repent you therefore be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times, not just one, but many, times of refreshing, of revival shall come from the presence of the Lord. The revival must come from God himself. And he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you whom the heaven must receive. The heavens must hold him and not let him come until Say, until the times of restitution of all things. Which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And that's why I said earlier, and now the message totally, but why has Jesus not come yet? Number one, he doesn't reckon time like we do. A thousand years with us, one day. He said, I'm coming soon, I'm coming without delay, I'm coming at once. He's been gone for less than two days, according to the way he records time. Number two, he wants as many saved as he can. He's been waiting for all of us. He's still waiting. And number three, the inheritance is not ready yet. The inheritance must be ready for God to give his son the inheritance, the heathen. And that's our job. That's our job. Now, there are a number of reasons. I'm going to use five reasons why revival tarries. The first one is because the church is no longer tarrying before the Lord in fervent prayer for God's love and healing to be activated in people's lives. The prayer room has been exchanged for the TV and the lunch room. Prayer rooms are empty. They're doing away with them now. The altars, they're not being used for people to cry out to God anymore. Look at the book of Luke's gospel, the 24th chapter of, of St. Luke. And what did Jesus say? He said, whatever you do, don't leave, don't leave Jerusalem. Tarry in Jerusalem. Until you be endued with power from on high. is Luke 24. And let's read from verse 44. And it says here. And he said unto them. These are the words which I spake unto you. While I was yet with you. That all things must be fulfilled. It was a fulfilled. Which were written in the law of Moses. And in the prophets and in the Psalms. Concerning me. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day. And the repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry, and we'll say tarry, Tarry, wait in the city of Jerusalem until, say until, you be endued with power from on high. You know, 
I guess we're, we all want everything right now. And I've had evangelists say, you know, you don't need to tarry. You don't need to wait in a prayer room. You don't need to seek God for the Holy Spirit. I'll lay my hands upon you and you can receive right away. And sometimes it happens. And wonderful when it does. But oftentimes they just speak a few words and tongues and, oh, you've got it now. And that's the end of it. But there was no tarrying. No crying unto God. I'll share with you something I don't think I've ever told you in this church. In about 1961, I was traveling as a McCormick Biscuit traveler. And I spent six years with them, and I spent about ten years altogether in sales with Swift Canadian and with McCormick Biscuits. And I was, it was about 1961, I had started on the radio two years before I left my job because I was earning a lot of money. I was earning literally as much as a lawyer could, would earn at that time. I was on a straight 10% commission basis. The only salesman in the country had my own car and paid my own expenses. I sold a lot of biscuits to the big Safeway stores and, and the super value stores and the rinky dinky little country grocery stores. And I started on the radio over Radio Cary in Blaine, Washington, over CFCW here, Moose Jaw, Chab and Moose Jaw. And uh, I was in Prince Rupert on the weekend. I would go for 10 days to Prince Rupert and back. I lived in Prince George, my wife and I and our children. And uh, on a Sunday night, I was uh, invited to preach in the Native Revival, Native uh, Friendship House, Friendship Center. And I was in the service, and they were leading the singing, and all of a sudden a clergyman walked in. He was dressed in a black suit and had a collar on, and I recognized him as a clergyman, and I got up, and he walked up to me, and he said, Max Solbrecken. I said, yes. He said, oh, my name is Dean Patterson. I'm the dean of the Anglican Cathedral here in Prince Rupert. And I've come to ask you to forgive me. And I said, why? Well, he said, you didn't know it, but I didn't like you. I was very much against you. I spoke against you. He said, I... You were causing trouble in my church because some of my members, my parishioners were coming to your meetings when I would be in Rupert. I would preach different places and, and they're talking about being born again and talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit and talking about being healed. They said, I didn't like you. You were causing disruption in my church, the Anglican Cathedral. And I was so disturbed. I went to see the pastor of the First United Church, Dr. Elliot, said, Dr. Elliot, I'm in trouble. I, there's this preacher, you maybe have heard of him, Max Solbrick, and he's a McCormick biscuit salesman, and he preaches, and, and he's causing a lot of difficulty. He told Dr. Elliot what he was going through. He said, Dr. Elliot, what shall we do with Max Solbrick? Dr. Elliot said, Dean Patterson, we shouldn't do anything with Max Solbrecken. He said, Dr. Elliot, why do you say that? He said, because I believe that Max Solbrecken has something that you, Dean Patterson, and I, Dr. Elliot, do not have. He said, I was so concerned now that I went to the cathedral I was all alone in the cathedral, and I laid down on my face, on the, on the floor, in the form of a cross, beneath the cross. I said, God, what does Max Solbrick and the McCormick biscuit salesman have from you that Dr. Elliot and I don't have? How long 
I lay there, I don't recall. I was weeping, I was crying. I was so troubled, and all of a sudden, God came upon me and filled me with the Holy Spirit. And I was filled with fire, speaking in tongues, and praising the Lord. And he said to people, in my church, there's a new message, and I'm a new preacher. And for a while, it went okay, and then all of a sudden, they felt that it wasn't for them. And they've asked me to leave. And tomorrow morning, my wife and my family and I were leaving Prince Rupert to go to Seattle. I've been invited by my father, Dennis Bennett, of the Episcopalian Church, to work with him. So I said, would you address the people? And he did, and we prayed for him, and then he went. And I got up, and I preached, and I took an offering for him. And at near midnight, you know how the natives they have long meetings. And I drove up to his little house there, and everything was dark, and I put the envelope in his mailbox. And then word began to come back that he was really cutting a swath in Seattle with the Anglicans and the Episcopalians. I believe that the time has come that we've got to get earnest and hungry for God. Dean Patterson said, I was so, I was so troubled. He said, I was so hungry for, to, for God, I didn't know what to do. And then God filled me with the Holy Spirit. There are preachers who say, yes, you can get it. You don't need to tarry. But I am from the old school. I believe we need to tarry. Amen. I need to... We do. We need to pray and seek God, seek God, seek God. It says in 2 Chronicles 7 and 14, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. If my people, he's not talking about the pagan now, he's not talking about the heathen now, He's not talking about the drunkard now. He's talking about you and me. You and I. If my people, which are called by my name, we are believers, we are the family of Jesus, will humble ourselves, get rid of the dirty, rotten, filthy sin of pride, pride of place and face and race, humble ourselves, and begin to pray and seek God. Seek the face of God. Get close enough to God to see his face. I mean, be right there in his face. Wrap ourselves in his arms. And turn from our wicked ways. Then God will hear from heaven. He'll forgive our sins. And heal our land. And he has promised. John 14. 14 to 18. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father. He shall give you another comforter. He may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive because it seeth them not. Neither know them. But ye know him. For he dwelleth with you. And he shall be in you. The nearest place to the heart of God is the place of worship, repentance, and faith. If you're in the place where you're worshiping, if you're worshiping God in that place of prayer, repenting with faith in your heart and worshiping God, God will meet you. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Bible, pardon me, the Holy Bible abounds with testimonies of people who came to the end of themselves and they cried out to the Lord and received forgiveness, healing, and deliverance. Don't forget, the shed blood of Jesus Christ makes it possible for fallen man to enter into the very Holy of Holies the very presence of Almighty God. And prayer is a channel through which we make contact with our Heavenly Father, 
through the name of Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ stated, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come to him. I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. Revelation 3.20. I've always used that as a, a text to win souls. Sinners just call on the Lord. He stands knocking at your heart's door. But that great theologian, Dr. Ole Hollisby, founder of Norway's Independent Theological Seminary, in 1931 said this, I doubt that I know of a passage in the whole Bible which throws greater light upon prayer than this one does. It is, it seems to me, the key. The key which opens the door into the holy and blessed realm of prayer. He writes, to pray is to let Jesus into our hearts. This teaches us, in the first place, it is not our prayer which moves the Lord Jesus. Do you hear that? It's not our prayer that moves the Lord Jesus. It is Jesus who moves us to pray. He knocks, thereby he makes known to us his desire to come into us. Our prayers are always a result of Jesus knocking at our heart's doors. I'd never seen it in that light before from that scripture. But Dr. Ole Hollisby, that great theologian that shook up Norway in the 1930s, says it's the greatest scripture on prayer. Revelation 3.20 Isaiah 65 and 24, before they call, I will answer. Before they call. He'll answer before we call. He is drawing us before we knew it. Hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. hallelujah. Psalm 16 11. The Bible says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. In thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Dr. Andrew Murray said, His prayer that promises have their fulfillment, the kingdom for his coming, and the glory of God for his full revelation. How quickly we are deceived in the resting, in the form of prayer, while the power is missing. He's at an early training teaching of the church, the influence of habit, the stirring of the emotions, any of these can lead to prayer that has virtually no spiritual power to be taught true prayer that which takes hold of God's strength and to which the gates of heaven are open wide. We think that we're doing God a favor by calling on him. We think it's, we're the ones that are involved. No, he is drawing us. It was the Holy Spirit that got Mark to pray in tongues. It was the Holy Spirit that brought that upon him so that when this great problem arose, he had the power. The second reason why revival tarries because the church is not awaiting and longing for Christ's return. And we are delinquent in our call to prepare. The church is no longer waiting for his return or desiring his return. The church no longer even preaches about the second coming in many churches. Some years ago, when we were in the U.S. of A., we flipped on the channel and we got some of the religious stations and we got TBN and Oral Roberts was still alive at that time. And they were interviewing him. He said, just before that terrible catastrophe over there, when the tsunami hit, or when they grew waters over there, at least uh, in Louisiana. He said, I was walking down the road in, 
in California. And all of a sudden, I had a vision. And the sky was black over the USA. And God said, I'm sending judgment to America. And Oral said, why? He said, my preachers are no longer preaching the gospel. They're preaching everything but the gospel. And my preachers are not preaching about the second coming of Jesus. And Oral Roberts said, I began to weep and cry and repent. I couldn't remember the last time I had spent an entire hour in a full sermon on the second coming. When he was in his great ministry, every crusade, the last night, he'd preach for an hour and a half on the coming of Jesus. And I saw him there and he was pointing with his index finger at me and every preacher. He said, preacher, get the fire of God in your belly. Preach about the coming of Jesus. It's just in 1 John 3, 1 to 2. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. We should be, be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are you the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear. Say, appear. appear. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. The book of Matthew's gospel, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until, and we'll say, until the day. That Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in a field. The one shall be taken, the other left. Two shall be grinding of the mill. The one shall be taken, the other shall be left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your do Lord doth come. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Therefore, be ye also ready. For such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24, 14, 27, 36, 42, 44. Titus 2, 12 to 14, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we, shall live, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking, say looking, Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. First Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. For they themselves show us what manner of entering we had unto you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God, and to wait, say wait, wait, wait. For his son from heaven. Live a Christian life. Live a pure life. And wait. And look. And Terry. Wait for his son from heaven. Whom he raised from the dead. Even Jesus. Which delivered us from the wrath to come. Hebrews 10.37. For yet a little while. And he that shall come. Will come. And will not tarry. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hebrews 9, 28. The first time Jesus came, it was as a sin bearer, as God's paschal lamb, and our substitute to put away sin forever through his vicarious death for us, his substitutionary death for us. The next time he comes, it'll be as a glorified reigning king. Here's the key. Unto them that look for him and are waiting patiently and earnestly for his return. 
When that happens, revival fires will burn again in the church. The third reason why revival tarries is this. Because the church has become lukewarm. It's love for our Savior. And it's in grave danger. The church is in grave danger. Revelation 3. And unto the angel of the church of the Lord, he is right. These things say of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and will say lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew, I will spew, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. The shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Turn around. Out of the seven churches, book of Revelation, Jesus Christ appearing to John the Revelator on the Isle of Patmos. Seven churches. Take these messages to the seven churches. And out of the seven, five of them, he said, repent. Five. Five. Repent. The fourth reason, fourth reason that revival tarries is because the church has taken away the leadership of the Holy Spirit and placed it in human hands. And yet Jesus said in John 15, he says, But when the Comforter has come, whom I will send from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. I have yet many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. But when the Spirit of truth is come, he, he, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. When I was in Newfoundland, in 1968, our crusade shook Newfoundland with crowds of thousands every night. Every church had their own school at that time. And the Pentecostals had about a 12 buses. It was in the summertime and they would go out and pick up people all over central Newfoundland. And every night there were thousands in the meeting. I went on there for weeks. They called me from the radio station. It was a network in Gander. And as I was being interviewed by their head interviewer, suddenly he couldn't speak. And he started to cry and I said, are you a backslider? He said, yes. He says, would you take 10 minutes and tell the people what you believe is the, is the biggest mistake the church has made in the last 2,000 years until I gained my composure. So I preached for 10 minutes. I said, the greatest mistake the church has ever made in the past 2,000 years is this. There are two reasons. Two things. Number one, the church has taken the authority to lead the church out of the hands of the Holy Spirit and put that power into the hand of popes and cardinals and bishops and pastors when the Holy Spirit should be leading the church, guiding the church. And the second is, they have rejected the word of God, which he has inspired. The Holy Spirit has inspired. When I was finished and he gained his, re, regained his composure, we signed off and we were walking towards the front desk. I saw two men coming 
walking quickly. I thought, now they're going to bawl me out for making their, <laughs> their uh, man cry. But no, they said, Reverend Soul Brecken, all the lines are jammed. There's 72,000 people listening. We have a television station across the street. Go over there. They're waiting for you. Do the same thing over there. <laughs> Can you shout hallelujah? In 1987, my wife and I were over there in Latin America, in Argentina. The first Pentecostal conference of Latin America, 35 thousand people in that great building I was one of the speakers there were six of us one each evening for six nights I picked up the Newsweek magazine on the front page it, there was a picture there and it says Latin America Latin America Predominantly cardinal red is turning Protestant black. The whole front page. Cardinal red, the, car, the Roman Catholic Church. And the article said that the Roman Catholic Church were losing 400 members every, every hour to the evangelicals. At that time, I was writing for the Edmonton Sun. And I wrote about the big meeting we were having. And then I said about the Holy Spirit. It's a conference on the Holy Spirit. And then I said, the Roman Catholic Church, they believe that the Pope, the Pope has been given the authority to lead the church. That the Pope is in fact the vicar of Jesus Christ, a small Christ. I said, I'm sorry, Pope John Paul II. I didn't know the Holy Spirit had taken early retirement. <laughs> the fifth reason why the revival hasn't come, why revival tarries, is because the church has lost the burden for lost souls. We no longer care about our brothers and sisters. We no longer care about our neighbors. The church has lost. I'm going to read to you from Matthew, St. Matthew's Gospel, the ninth chapter. Let me read it to you. And for all of those of you listening on the internet, on the YouTube, this is for you. Christians, get right with God. Sinners, turn to Christ before it's too late. Matthew, the ninth chapter, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness, every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Everyone shout, compassion. Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And saith he unto his disciples, truly, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray you therefore. Pray you therefore. The Lord of the harvest, he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Jesus healed all the sick that came to him. He cast out demons. He forgave the sinners. And he looked over the multitudes. He was moved with compassion. Compassion is the missing ingredient. Compassion is the necessary thing. We need compassion for the poor and the needy and the lost, the sick and the suffering. I got such, a, such compassion for my precious brother Hervé. I couldn't hold it back. I get that compassion every day. If I don't have it, I pray until it comes. 
that I might have compassion for a lost world, the world that Christ died to save. Compassion. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted. They fainted and they fell by the wayside. They were scattered abroad. A sheep having no shepherd. Saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous. There's a great harvest. But number two, the laborers are few. Not many care. We are commanded to pray the Lord of the harvest. He was sent for the laborers into his harvest. Let me go to James. And I'm closing in a few moments here. James chapter 5. And I want to read something that's powerful. It's in verse number 7. Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. Now the long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Be patient, therefore. Brethren, with a long patience, don't give up. Don't stop praying. Don't stop <coughs> witnessing. Don't stop giving. Don't stop being kind to your neighbor. Be patient, therefore, even unto the coming of the Lord. Don't stop until he comes. Behold, the husband man waiteth. God the Father waits for the precious fruit of the earth, for the inheritance. He waits. The precious fruit of the earth is the inheritance. Christ's inheritance is the precious fruit of the earth. Be patient, ever, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband man waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. And with long patience, that's long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be also patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord. Draw now. Couple more scriptures, John 4. Jesus said in John chapter 4 and verse 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then come a harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look unto the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Look unto the fields, lift up your eyes and look to the fields. It's harvest time. He that reapeth the re receiveth, and he that reapeth the receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. That both he that soweth, he that reapeth, may rejoice together. Say not, ye, there are yet four months. Don't say we have plenty of time. It's going towards night. We well, would say it's going towards night. And they haven't come home. The kids haven't come home. It's going towards night. Vern, Peterson sings it so beautifully. I was but a boy in days of childhood. I used to pray till the evening shadows fall. Then winding down an old familiar pathway, I heard my mother call supper time. Supper time. Come home, son. It's supper time. Come home, son. It's supper time. The God Immortel is in Norwegian. The God Immortel is going towards night. The God Immortel is going towards night. The sun is going down. So don't say that you have lots of time. The ninth chapter, verse 4, Jesus said, I must work of my Father. I must work the works of my Father while there is day, because night cometh when no man shall be able to work. I want to tell you a little story before I close. John Harper's last convert, 
the RMS Titanic with 2,224 passengers and crew aboard on his maiden journey from Southampton, England to New York City sank in the North Atlantic Ocean at about 2 a.m. April the 15th, 1912. Four days after their launch, they struck a massive iceberg and sank in a couple of hours. There were only lifeboats for about half of those aboard. Between 1490 and 1635 deaths. They're not sure how many did die. They had received six warnings of sea ice on April the 14th, the day before. But the owner didn't want to slow down. He would make the biggest splash ever in the record time from England to New York. Six warnings, there are icebergs, there's sea ice. You should turn to the side the long way. But he said, no. He said, nothing can sink this ship. The creator, the builder said, not even God can sink this ship. And the lookout shouted, iceberg, iceberg. It was too late. They tried to turn the boat. But his side was ripped open. And they died. Some say there were 1,490. Others say there might have been up to 1,635. John Harper was a preacher of the gospel heading to New York City. When it happened, he asked the band to play Nearer My God to Thee. He went to them all. Are you saved? You must give your heart to Jesus. The woman said, no, I'm not saved. Here, take my life jacket. He gave her his life jacket because she wasn't saved. The boats were not properly filled. Some of them left half empty. Two hours or so it was down. John Harper was in the water. The water was ice cold. He was holding on to a piece of wreckage. People crying and praying and weeping all around. Dying. A young boy was next to him. A young man. He said, young man, are you saved? He said, no. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then a wave took him away. And now John Harper's fingers were cold as ice. He was losing his grip. And all of a sudden, a wave brought the young, back, young man back near him. And he said, young man, young man, are you saved now? He said, no, not yet. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved, my boy. And all of a sudden his fingers lost their power. And he slipped into the water. Two weeks later, there was a mission was filled with people in New York. A young man at the back said, could I say something? He said, yes, come forward. He told the story. He said, I was there. I was that young man. When I saw John Harper's fingers lose their strength and I saw him slip down into the water, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you I'm John Harper's last convert. <laughs> His last convert. For 50 years, Pastor Max Solbrecken has awakened the conscience of his audiences through the anointed proclamation of the claims of Christ who said, No man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. The truth is, you are either for him or against him. You cannot remain neutral. Great costs are involved in spreading of Christ's gospel. Please consider investing in this ministry. Contact Max Solbrecken at MSWM, Box 44220, RPO, Garside, Edmonton, Alberta. T5V1N6 Canada.
You have been watching the Come Home to Jesus television ministry with Canada's preacher man, Dr. Max Solbrecken, who has proclaimed the Word of God across the world for 50 years without fear or favor of man or devil. Ask for Canada's revival magazine, The Cry of His Coming, when you write. Invest in souls by supporting this end time ministry. Please contact Max Solbrecken at MSWM Box 44220, RPO Garside, Edmonton, Alberta, T5V1N6, Canada. Oh, die again.